and perspectives uh, on programming and um, I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, a few really interesting and strange tool chains um, that have kind of come across in a lot of like the really uh, unique kind of work that I do. Um, so I am a creative technologist, uh, a maker, educator, and dataist. So um, basically creative technology is a bit of a buzzword right now. Um, it's basically summed up as different ways that we can start applying technology. Um, to our everyday experience in ways that we kind of don't expect um, and you know unique experiences where we're not kind of thinking of technology in the same ways that we have before. Um, I'm also a big part of the maker movement. Um, so the maker movement, um, you know, lots of Arduinos, if you know what that is, um, and just spaces where we come together and uh, talk a bit about how we make things, uh, why we make things, and sort of share with each other. Um, I uh, am a professor of interaction design at Sheridan College and at OCAD University, and I'm also a, a dataist. So dataism is um, basically a, a type of absurdist art. Uh, and I make whimsical robots. That's basically how I summarize everything that I that I do. It's like widely varying, as, as I'll show you guys some of the weird things that I make. Um, and uh, I'm also a um, I'm director at an organization called Site Three Collaboratory. So Site Three is at Lauren Ossington. You can come and visit us every Tuesday and Thursday night from seven to ten. And we are um, just uh, you know just a regular old makerspace. Uh, we do things like make large scale fire art. Um, so this is a piece that was for Burning Man two years ago. It's uh, called the Charcade. So it's an uh, arcade wherever all the games are fire related. Um, so the big one that, that uh, was produced at Site 3 was called uh, Risky Ball, so it's a skeet ball, but there's fire. Um, my personal favorite is Dance Dance Immolation. Um, it's like Dance Dance Revolution, except every time you mess up, you're engulfed in flames. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, and a lot of the stuff that comes out of Site 3 uh, goes to Burning Man, but we also do all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, so you should come by and check us out. Um, and uh, I'm also a co-organizer. Uh, on the Maker Festival team. Um, Maker Festival this year is at the Reference Library July 8th and 9th. Uh, if you like making things in any capacity, I super suggest coming. It's, it's really a lot of fun. There's stuff uh, for everyone from kids to adults to crafting people to programmers, just like any kind of making that you can imagine happens um, July 8th and 9th at the Reference Library. Um, and it's just a lot of fun. Um, so the main company uh, I work with, my company is called Little Data. Um, and we're sponsored by Intel basically to make really strange things. Um, that's what we do. Um, we just make something that you're gonna, you know, kind of wonder why it exists. Um, so uh, a little data is, this is a Venn diagram of people who are interested in the things that I do. Um, people who like dataism, so a form of um, kind of older absurdist art, and people who like data. Um, so, you know, the kind of joke is um, big data, little data, a uh, very small intersection of people who that's funny to, but I assure you it is funny to them. Um, I primarily work with my collaborator, Hilary Predko, so a lot of these projects are uh, both of us. Um, I have a background, um, you know, all of my education is in uh, fine arts, however, I have also uh, worked as a developer um, on large scale websites before, um, kind of, you know, as a way to put myself through art school. <laughs> Um, and Hillary has a background in uh, textiles and fabrication, so um, she has a degree in material arts and design, um, and does a lot of like product um, product designing and uh, kind of supply chain management um, and production work. So um, our skills kind of really meet in the middle um, at laser cutters. Uh, for some reason, that's our one common overlap. A lot of our projects contain large lasers, um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about about that. So we run a, a conference every year called Make Change, um, another thing that you guys should check out. So Make Change uh, is basically about um, kind of different ways that we can fabricate, fabricate things and how that influences our lives, everything from education to social culture to kind of the internet and, and all those things. So um, every year we run this conference called Make Change. Uh, this year it's going to be in November at the Design Exchange. Um, so yeah, uh, it's, I think it's fun. 
Uh, you may also have heard this thing that, that we uh, organize called the Stupid Shit That No One Needs and Terrible Ideas Hackathon. Um, if you want to see some truly stupid ideas, uh, go to stupidhacktoronto.com. Uh, there's some really awful stuff there. Um, and we're going to run it again this year, so it's going to be a whole lot of fun. Uh, and you know, it's basically, you may have, have heard of this stuff uh, before, it's kind of like a critique on, you know, what has the internet become, um, you know, what has technology become, and are we even engaging with it in a remotely productive way. Um, so, basically, what, uh, what I do is make things that don't make sense into reality. Um, and a lot of this is kind of finding ways to do that. Uh, given you know a compromise between the things that I know how to do, the things that I want to do, and the things that the client wants, um, which involves huge amounts of negotiation. Um, so art school has you know I've spent um, you know seven years uh, in art school, getting uh, my undergrad, getting my masters, and I find that it prepares you really well to try and find uh, ideas and to to make things up and to imagine the possibilities. Um, and to even imagine kind of the technical aspect of the possibilities, like how could this go together in, in some way on a very top level, but it really prepares you very poorly for um, the world of actually producing those things. Um, you know, it kind of helps you really much get 80% um, of the way there, and then I find not only art school, but all of technology kind of just drops us at the last 20%. Um, and, and that's a little bit about what we'll be talking about. So who will design the future and who will build it? Um, there's a lot of uh, talk about, um, you know, kind of the X-shaped designer or the T-shaped designer. These are designers that can reach into technology and they can reach into art and they can reach into science uh, and entrepreneurship and they can kind of all come together in the middle to create these seamless experiences. Um, but is that a reality and what steps are we doing to kind of get there and, and how is that space unfolding? Um, is it realistic to have an X or T shaped designer? Or, you know, how should these collaborations exist in the future? This is what I like to call the lie. Um, this is, is something that's kind of really pushed uh, pretty heavily through art school uh, processing and Arduino. These are two, um, if you aren't aware of them, they're these uh, platforms that are made for developing applic interactive applications. Um, processing is primarily screen based, um, and Arduino is primary, primarily physical based. So the kind of idea behind these two environments is that through using these two things, you can basically do and build anything. Um, and, and that's just not a true statement. Um, there's a lot of uh, things that happen here that allow us to be able to do everything. Um, and that involves you know, a lot of loading unnecessary things, um, make things that are compromises and performance compromises that exist to make these things easier. Um, and you know, a lot of this is about knowing when to break away from these tools and how far our proof of concept can get. Um, and a lot of these tools that make it really easy for us to get started um, kind of put us in a bit of an awkward place when it's time to finish or ship a project. So um, everyone can make is also this idea. Um, this is from a workshop that I, that I did using a program called 123 to Make um, with the premise that everyone can make. Um, this is actually the same Pikachu model um, and two people put it through, um, having vastly different ideas of what measuring means. Um, and now we have, you know, a, like a short, stocky Pikachu and a really tall Pikachu. Um, so, you know, maybe technically everyone can make, make, and I'm not really sure which Pikachu is the right Pikachu. Um, but certainly, you know, when we start to lower these barriers to entry, what does that mean for the kinds of outputs that we get? So um, when I you know, graduated from my master's, I was doing a lot of work uh, with, with hacking with kids. Um, and the tools that we have are great for this. Um, so these are two kids who made a superhero costume. We just strap batteries to children. Uh, everything's pretty great. Um, these are, this is a superhero costume that we made. Um, you know, it's <laughs> a lot of performance issues don't necessarily matter. Um, the wings on this little girl actually flap, which is pretty cool. Uh, she was really excited about that. Um, and this is, I would say, the ideal environment for a lot of these, these tools, right? The kids don't super care about performance issues. They don't care how many AAA batteries are attached to them. Um, you know, and, and I would say that this is the environment in which these things can really flourish. Um, this is another piece uh, that I made called, um, in collaboration with, with Hillary called uh, Hustle Bustle. So this was a piece that was inspired by uh, the peacock that ran away from the Toronto Zoo uh, a couple of years ago. Um, the peacock, uh, I would assume, wanted freedom. Um, so we made this 
um, bustle that as you run around, uh, it lights up and, you know, things kind of, um, you know, blink and move. Um, but, you know, in the process of making this, uh, we realize that there's no really good way to do things. And that's, you know, part of the problem. Um, in theory, all of these technologies exist. You want lights to blink, you want to know when someone is moving, we have two tools that do that. Um, but do these tools ever integrate in a way that works? Um, do they only work in kind of a learning environment or are there ways to kind of implement them um, meaningfully? So what ended up happening uh, was, uh, we, you know, we had hundreds of lights that we had to attach, um, you know, and school taught us that conductive thread was a great way to do that. That is not true. Um, so we ended up soldering hundreds and hundreds of uh, individual wires. And these things don't scale. Um, you know, the, the dress is, I would say, relatively uh, durable in terms of uh, modern wearables, um, but, you know, durability here is used in a very loose sense. Um, you know, it means that we can delicately roll it instead of having to delicately carry it. Um, but, you know, these tools um, aren't exactly something that you can um, build production quality things with. Um, another uh, piece that we made uh, was called the Cyborg Armor. So uh, Cyborg Armor was made for um, a circus performer. She uh, has a, a Lyra performance. A Lyra performance is basically she hangs off this hoop and spins in the air. Um, and she wanted a garment that is responsive to that. So she wanted something that um, responded to how she was moving. And she also wanted a garment that like was produced based on her routine that was very specific to this one piece. So we decided to do a little bit of data gathering um, and figuring out how, how that's gonna happen. So um, we wanted to get her, um, you know, the data of how she was moving through um, some kind of, you know, logging that somehow without it being invasive. So the big thing about this project is that she's against the hoop and if she falls, it's not good. Um, you know, so we have to have all of these like technology pieces that are really responding to the way she's moving, uh, and then also you know able to gather the information that we need. So this is the tool chain that I kind of came up with to make that happen. Um, this is a board called the Light Blue Bean. Uh, it's a Bluetooth device, and um, basically through uh, running a, a Node.js script, I'm able to output JSON, and then I'm going to take that data, put it into processing, take that processing data, export an illustrator file, take that into the laser, and laser cut it. That's my goal. So um, we were using um, the light blue beam with an accelerometer to gather X, Y, and Z data, movement, acceleration, uh, and what orientation she's in as well. So we had to find a really efficient and small way to strap that to her body, and then to get that information out. So I found, um, I found a plugin that was able to do this for me, um, and it's this, you know, pre-made script that very technically does what I want. And I feel like that's really the story of creative technology. It's like this technically accomplishes the task. Um, you know, it was able to get this X, Y, and Z data over time. Uh, it was able to output it to JSON. But, you know, as you can see, it's very poorly and inefficiently uh, formatted uh, in a way that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, and, you know, we have to like think a lot about compromising between uh, the amount of time it would take to rewrite these existing tools or to negotiate around them. So um, is it worth my time to rewrite this whole uh, script that gathers this data uh, and spits it out for me in a, in a format that I can process? Uh, or should I spend the time in uh, sitting in my software trying to figure out how to decode that information? Um, and this is kind of a constant thing between these pre-made tools, because they need to exist basically um, for everyone to do everything. So what I ended up doing uh, was using the terrible tool and uh, trying to find a way to parse it. So this is basically um, a mapping of all of her movements um, for her whole uh, dance. And we uh, mapped them onto Bezier curves. So every time she made a movement, uh, the X, Y, and Z data influences the pattern of the curve and like plots these individual points to it. Um, and uh, we came up with this, with this pattern, and we wanted to use this to somehow um, influence the aesthetic of her design. Um, and, you know, in my head, this was a lot different um, before, it, before it came out. I had done a bunch of tests with randomly generated numbers uh, to look at what kinds of things these, these patterns could make, but that's not actually how things work when you're 
like watching a dancer, she's not actually doing randomly generated movements. She's actually doing very specific uh, movements that come in a very specific order. Um, so um, I, you know, decided to like spend a bit of time playing around with code and mapping those values uh, differently. So this is the same values mapped to a radial design. Um, you know, trying to just find a way that the data can, in some way, be parsed visually in a meaningful capacity. Um, and kind of going through this a little bit more, uh, we decided to isolate each of the movements from X, Y, and Z um, and just look at how, you know, if we were to only display the X, Y, and Z data, what kind of things would that look like? Um, and will that give us kind of like a more meaningful or visual output? Um, you know, we went through several iterations. Uh, we went through the, these uh, ideas of compounding maybe the, X and the, the X's and the Y's um, and just kind of displaying that in different ways and seeing what that looks like. Um, we sort of ended with this uh, radial design over like the big, you know, uh, other design because it, you know, hoops and she's spinning off a hoop and there was some kind of thematic connection there. Um, and this is the one we kind of ended up with. So this is um, basically going through each of her movements um, and checking which of the axes was the most, uh, had the most profound influence, taking that one, um, plotting out that data and then color coding it. Um, so you can kind of see that the yellow dots are where she does a flip, um, and the pink ones are where she's spinning one way, and the, uh, or, um, ugh, the teal ones are where she's spinning the other way. So you can kind of watch her dance sort of unfold through these things. Um, and then what we, um, what we kind of realize is that like, artists you know, need to have control over the code. Um, you know, regardless of how these tool chains might not ultimately be very efficient, uh, regardless of you know, how, um, how there are way objectively better pieces of software that can accomplish the same thing as using processing, um, you know, communicating this idea of a visual design to a programmer is not something that works, right? Because it's about the art of playing with things and the art of trying to, to kind of figure out. So this is one of the, uh, the end pieces that we were able to put into, uh, into a laser and start cutting out uh, all of these designs. So we used different laser patterns and settings um, to cut these different pieces. Um, and then here it is with the microcontroller in it and the light behind it um, making some interesting designs. So this is kind of our end output. You can see that some of them are just you know, circles that are drawn, some of them are circles that are cut out, and this kind of corresponds to um, those original data sets. Um, and then it kind of turned out that, you know, in kind of true maker fashion, one microcontroller is never enough. Um, so we used a second Adafruit Flora uh, for the actual controlling of the device. So it kind of turns out that these, you know, very specific tools, one is actually not great for everything. You end up having to use these like kind of vast and intertwining tool chains. Um, and it turns out that the Adafruit Flora um, was the, the microcontroller that controls the lights but we were able to gather data through the light blue bean. Um, this is kind of just a process shot, kind of more to the point of, uh, of there's no good way to do things, um, especially in wearable technology, that's a huge thing. Um, so this is where we were trying to figure out where our wire traces would go and how they would fit around her body. Um, so we cut this uh, sample and we laid out all the lights and really the only way to do it, there's no way to do it with a circuit diagram, um, you really have to see how long things are, how everything fits around the body, and we had to do it with weird pieces of painter's tape. Um, so, you know, but one of the interesting things when people ask, like, how do you build creative technology, uh, how do you build wearables? Like, how do you make interactive clothing? Um, you know, the short answer is, I don't know, and sometimes we use tape. Uh, because there's, there's no set process for this at this time. Um, this is another project that uh, used similar um, technologies. Uh, it's called Punk Prism Power. It's uh, a Unity-based uh, game with physical peripherals. So um, basically, you have these two devices, and you're able to use them to kind of navigate this uh, hack and slash game uh, that's screen-based. Um, so this you know, tool chain was like relatively small. Um, you know, like there's certainly better and less expensive ways to do it. We ended up having Arduino to like Bean, transmitting a Bluetooth signal to a Node.js that goes to Unity. Um, which I would say is, is a pretty simple thing. And, um, you know, and then we're also using a, a Makey Makey, uh, which is basically like a, a capacitor sensing touch-based 
um, device that mimics a keyboard. So, um, you know, and that all kind of, you know, seems like, you know, we've already connected Bluetooth devices to our computer, we've already gathered data from them. Um, how hard could it be to connect multiple Bluetooth low energy devices to the computer? And the answer is like pretty damn annoying and hard. Um, and, and that's mostly because um, the people who designed this primarily want it to be easy for you to do a hello world task. Um, and it becomes increasingly difficult to do any kind of advanced task beyond the hello world. We did eventually manage to figure it out by like tracing the UUID um, device, like, devices of uh, names of each device um, and writing some custom scripts. But um, yeah, <laughs> the scalability of these things, uh, which becomes really a difficult thing because you start, um, you know, at one place and you're like, cool, I'm like 80% of the way there. And you're like, no, it's actually, you're not because the other 20% is a completely different thing. Uh, this is just kind of the, the insides of it. Um, this is another project uh, that kind of, you know, talks about scalability in a different kind of sense. This is the annual general mischief. Um, this was uh, at the Hand-Eye Society Ball last year, and it was basically uh, this idea that we'd have um, a couple of hundred people in the room, uh, and we would have this kind of, um, you know, meeting that was, it was in the Masonic Temple, so it was supposed to be, you know, akin to the secret meetings. Um, and uh, we would vote on all of these ridiculous topics. We'd vote on things like, should owls exist next year? Um, and we wanted to find a way that we could have all these people participate um, in this event um, and like also have it, you know, not uh, run into this like money and, um, you know, technology sort of problem. So how can we get uh, over 100 plus people to vote on these things? <laughs> um, that was kind of our big challenge. We have a big room, we want to engage a large amount of people. So uh, we started with 30 buttons to a multiplexer to our Arduino Mega to processing. So that's kind of the tool chain that, that we ended up using. Um, but unfortunately that ends up looking a lot like this. Um, so each of these things, you know, you're like, oh, okay, cool. So like a button has two wires, that's, that's good. Um, but then when you start scaling it up, you realize, you know, a little bit how absurd this is. And there's definitely better and cheaper ways to do it. But these tools kind of don't allow for, again, the scalability of, of objects to make large scale interactive things. So we did it. We took um, all these wires and we ran them around the giant boardroom table, taped them to the bottom of the table, and all these people were able to vote live. Um, and that was pretty neat. Um, this is another project um, that's basically uh, about DNA um, and genetics. So um, this was uh, an installation that we made uh, and basically um, it was about uh, identifying my own genetic mutations uh, and how to do that. Um, so basically each of these uh, icosahedrons corresponds to a letter in the genetic code um, and then it has a corresponding one that's mutated and one that is not mutated. Um, so you can kind of see how they're basically similar except one small thing and that actually has like oftentimes significant uh, profound like changes in the person but it's really just one letter in like a giant kind of volume. Uh, and the idea was that we would wear them as weird sculptures and it would be cool um, and you know each of them would light up uniquely so there are four different um, parts of the genetic code and each would um, you know light up and have a unique lighting pattern um, and when we tested that, you know, that seemed to work in theory. But my idea was, you know, I'll just go through the genetic code and find the differences, no big deal. Um, I know you're laughing, but I didn't think it would be a big deal. I really didn't. <laughs> um, you know, I was like, I know how to parse things. I parse things all the time. Um, but there are many ways to do this, and there are a whole bunch of different applications to do this. But if you're not doing it for a very specific scientific process, it's actually really, really difficult. If you're clearly doing this just for fun, um, you know, I wouldn't say aimlessly, but you know, not particularly coming from a scientific background, it's pretty, it's pretty difficult. Um, and tools that were given, such as processing, break down when you input large amounts of data. Um, and even if you divide, um, you know, the human genome into, you know, what I thought were small enough chunks, um, it's still enough to really kind of gum up the works. Um, so we did many, you know, ideas of testing and iterations um, to kind of, you know, try and get this to work with the tool set that I was familiar with. And it actually turned out to basically be impossible. Um, I had to write uh, a whole different application that was able to do this. 
Um, and you know, even though we test it with um, other kinds of data, um, you're just, you just don't have the kind of flexibility that you need to work with uh, data sets of multiple different um, like sizes and, and like densities of data. Um, so we ended up, this is, this is a picture of uh, my kitchen the morning that we installed. <laughs> it was just full of, um, it's a small apartment, but it was like you could not open the fridge full of icosahedrons because the genetic code is really big. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is another um, project that I'm going to go through. Uh, it's called Toastrits. Uh, so uh, basically we wanted to put people's faces on toast. That was our goal. Um, so we did it for the Make Maker Festival launch party. We wanted to put 300 people's faces on toast. Um, and we wanted a seamless user experience. Um, yeah, and our goal is just how can we get your face on toast with the least trouble. Um, so, you know, in, in theory, uh, it seemed easy. This is the tool chain I ended up using. Uh, video feed to calibration to processing to export to image magic to a shell script, to laser cut 5.3, toast, and possibly peanut butter and jelly. Um, so uh, I'll kind of just talk about how we got to this conclusion of, you know, in my mind, it was, we will take a photo and we will put it in the laser software. Um, so uh, yeah, we do a, a lot of work with lasers. <laughs> um, this is a picture of me inside a large laser, um, fixing it, and I just, I just really like lasers. Um, so our first uh, challenge was to produce a two-color photo for the laser. Um, so we uh, wrote this processing application um, that, in theory, does that. Um, you know, it looks through, it takes you know the image that the webcam is getting, and it produces um, you know an array of pixels. You decide the threshold. If it's under this, then it becomes black. If it's over that, then it becomes white. Um, unfortunately, that's not really again the way it works in practice. Uh, you get a lot of people standing in front of cameras who are standing outside of the light, and then or you know they turn their face a certain way, and then it's all black or it's all white. Um, people uh, wearing hats, people doing all kinds of things that just make it not kind of not work. Um, so we had to have a, kind of a secret calibration uh, moment where we just tell people like, yeah, just get comfy in the camera, and we'd be in the background kind of like tweaking it. Um, and then uh, we brought it into uh, LaserCut 5.3. Uh, and if you've ever gone to a makerspace, this may look familiar for you, to you. LaserCut 5.3 is the most popular and by far the worst laser software ever. <laughs> it makes no sense, um, but it's everywhere. So most lasers I've ever worked with uh, use this software. Um, and I should have known when I was like, LaserCut 5.3 is going to be part of my tool chain, um, that it would be kind of chaos. Um, so we're trying really hard to import these, um, these images, and they're just not showing up. In laser cut, you know, things aren't working. We're like, this makes sense. It is a GIF that is rendered with physically only two colors, right? So how is that not a two-color GIF? Um, but then, you know, um, ooh, that should be somewhere else. But then we decided, we discovered this program called Image Magic. Um, so basically, you can run through your command line and you can basically convert uh, files to like what is technically a two-color GIF, which is actually different than a um, than a theoretical two-color GIF. Uh, and we're able to accommodate the very, very specific parameters that LaserCut 5.3 needs. Um, and you know, through this, I realized that, like, I was like, how am I going to do that? Processing doesn't allow me to specify which kind of GIF I want to save this as, because it's made for easy exporting of GIFs. It's made for you click, you you know, put in this line of code, like export GIF, and done. Um, but that's not really the reality, especially when you get into a lot of these more complex tools and mushing them together. So um, you know, this is when I you know, stopped treating processing like processing and basically started writing Java inside processing um, because it's really the only way to do things, right? Um, and that's kind of like prompted me to kind of get over to mostly just writing things in Java because you butt up against the end of these things and you're like, there's no way to specify it. Um, and as an art student, as someone who spent seven years in art school, I was just like, now I understand. Um, yeah, so tools that are made to help really quickly become a hindrance here. Um, part of uh, another thing we ran into was we needed to make this uh, toast jig. So uh, basically a way of knowing where we should place each of the pieces of toast. Um, but, you know, trying to negotiate these things of exporting images from one janky program to the next janky program. Um, 
ended up, you know, like something that's it's very, very difficult to do and kind of like an ongoing uh, problem that we experience. Um, but in the end, we were able to do it. Uh, we produced many hundreds of pieces of toast with people's faces on them, and they really liked them, so that was cool. They weren't very edible, though. Uh, later toast does not actually taste very good. <laughs> Who knew? Um, so, uh, we uh, received also a request um, to kind of do the same thing. Um, can you put five, uh, can 500 people all design a custom laser cookie? And the event is in five days. So I was like, well, I already kind of did that, right? Like, it's kind of the same thing, right? It's basically whatever. Um, but uh, this, it's not actually true. So you can actually go and see this today. Uh, it's, it's on at Honest Ed's. Uh, it's going to be there all day. Um, and you can um, take any message that you want, and you can go through this application, and um, basically it sends it to, uh, to the laser cutter, and the laser cutter cuts it on a cookie uh, using a cookie jig derived from the toast jig. Um, and, um, and yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. I actually, like, yeah, I suggest you guys go get a cookie. Um, but in doing this, we ran into way more um, problems with moving files, trying to make it an even more seamless experience, right? Uh, so we had this idea that we would have a network uh, drive, and that once you press this button, it would call a command that would convert the file, move it to the network drive, pick it up, easy peasy. Um, but um, basically what it ended up being is a lot of debugging without proper feedback. Uh, because a lot of this, again, was written in a piece of software that doesn't allow you to see what's going on under the hood. Um, so it ended up basically totally being impossible to just move a file because I had no way to document the output of where it was actually going uh, and what was actually happening. So I ended up having to use this guy, uh, Automator, uh, who's a pretty good buddy of mine. Um, and not because it is the simplest or even best solution, uh, but because it was the only you know, high-level solution that would allow me to, to use it because you're working through all of these tools that are supposed to be there to help you. But tool chains are a thing we all deal with, you know, like we all put one thing to another thing to another thing and it's not unique to creative technology, it's not unique to the things that, that I'm doing, but, um, but there are no set protocols yet. There's no, a lot of this we haven't accepted that that's the tool chain that we have to go through. So the question I've really been asking um, but is what does it look like, um, what does prototyping look like in an academic setting and how can we learn to create the future? Um, and a lot of these things, um, a lot of these things come from being in art school and trying to learn how to do things, uh, right? And trying to learn to make your ideas real, to do a proof of concept. Um, and a big tool for that is things like IFTTT. Uh, and I actually really like uh, IFTTT. It's um, a really great way to get, way to get started. Right? Um, so basically what you do is you say, if one channel does one thing, then um, another channel does another thing. It's really made to be plug and play. You can go onto it and say, like, every time uh, Donald Trump posts to Twitter, update my Facebook, um, or log it in a Google spreadsheet for later use, uh, whatever it is you want to do. Um, and it's all in the idea of having easy and simple proof of concept. But what do you, how are you able to get these prototypes to level two? When you want it to actually go to production, what's involved in that? And most of my like, professional and academic career is untangling the messes that other people have made. Um, that art students have tried to force and jam these tools into doing what they want, um, thinking that it's just one step ahead. You know, I have this trigger that does this, and all it needs to do is talk to this other thing. Um, I've done some really, you know, untangled some really strange webs of people, you know, faking mouse clicks with actual motors that are clicking my, like a mouse, um, doing really, really strange things to activate things. Um, and it's because we're trying, you know, we're kind of told that these tools uh, are going to help us build the future, but I don't know that they really are, right? They're really great for, for getting the first step of things done. Um, so, you know, I really feel like it's always 0 to 80 percent, 5 hours, 80 to 100 percent, just destroy it and do a different thing. Um, because there's no way that we actually can use these tools to get to the end. Um, and a lot of, you know, what, uh, what we get with this stuff is why can't you just X, Y, Z, right? From a client, uh, from, you know, from, you know, a, a friend, other people who, who do a lot of, like, heavy programming. Um, and the answer is always really complex. It's just like because this tool 
is not specifically made for that. It has not accommodated for any uh, anything that the creator has not already foreseen. Um, it becomes really difficult to make small changes. It's like, well, why can't we just make this like a little bit bigger? Why can't we just make this, you know, also do that? It's like, it's not always possible. Um, and it's kind of this idea of adjusting uh, the idea of expectations of product and production level experiences. Um, what methods are we going to use to build the future, and what do those look like? Um, you know, is it that we find tools and platforms that allow us to scale things to production level, or do we, um, you know, develop professional quality tools that um, allow us, you know, to skip some of the, like, uh, you know, skip a large chunk of the work, but are also maybe sacrificing a few user experience elements, maybe sacrificing, you know, a little bit of the barrier to entry that allow us to have the flexibility we need to create these things. Um, so just to reiterate, a lot of these advanced tools kind of, you know, allow people to get going really quickly, but they don't allow anyone to do anything that's kind of more specific than anything that is out of the box. A lot of time is spent negotiating uh, how one thing talks to the next thing um, and what that looks like uh, when, if you kind of just get down to it, um, there is a very simple solution. But the degree that people will go to to not use the command line, it's just out of this world. Um, so, you know, this is, you know, kind of coming to a head in, in maker culture where we have all these products that are built to accommodate every situation. Um, and I don't think that's the way to build the future, um, but we do need to find a way where artists and designers can engage on a technological level, but their, uh, their work can also be used in a production setting. Um, and that's kind of, you know, the challenge and the thing that I'm trying to feel out with my work is how we can create this, this sort of balance between engineers and artists where they're, you know, it's not only that they're talking to each other and that they have vocabulary, but like there's actually a way for them to um, physically collaborate on their work. Um, and you know, it's just about kind of knowing uh, when when it's Arduino time and when it's not Arduino time. Uh, there's lots of other chips that kind of do this thing where they sacrifice the user experience um, and, in essence, are able to kind of do a lot more. It takes down a lot of uh, the barriers. Um, and they're coming, they're coming up more and more, I think, as people butt up against the ends of, uh, of processing and Arduino and all of these like intro type tools. Um, so yeah, learn, learn how and why things work. Um, you know, not only that they do, it's great that they work, um, but why is that happening? And that's how you can start to, to really um, look under the hood of things and see, and see how you can manipulate them to do what you actually want. Um, and push tools to their limit, but know when you've spent more time trying to make this tool work than it would be to just learn things the other way. Um, so yeah, um, that's, that's kind of it. You can look out for uh, some stuff that I'm doing with Little Data um, with uh, an organization called Make Fashion. We're showing uh, something in, um, in April in Calgary and it's called the Drone Dress. So it's basically gonna be a large dress that has two drones that hold up the train. Uh, it's going to be pretty wild. Um, and yeah, if you uh, don't hesitate to reach out, um, and happy to chat about creative technology and the intersection between engineering and um, you know arts. And I also encourage you folks to come by Site 3 Collaboratory on a Tuesday or a Thursday. Um, on Tuesdays we have um, Women and LGBTQ Alliance Night, um, and Thursdays is uh, a general open house. So um, we just have fun, talk about code programming, and all kinds of weird tool chains, so thank you.